So Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, we were sort of uh, a bit flummoxed as to what to do for the first presentation of the new term in the midst of winter, and we thought that um, talking about um, doom and disaster might cheer you all up. Um, so um, it's, very, it's great fun, actually, doom and disaster, when it's happening to someone else. Um, as we like that sort of photograph, don't we, and we get a bit of a chuckle out of... Uh, it happening far away. Um, but it's not quite so much fun when it happens closer at home, and um, particularly when it gets uh, personal, as uh, the well-known, balanced and non-hysterical newspaper um, below shows. Um, this matters to all of us, and um, we have to investigate when things go wrong, obviously. Um, the thing is, we work in the NHS, and the NHS is fabulous, as many of us know, at taking a good idea and mangling it a bit. And um, what I'm going to say now about the NHS process is I would like to stress no criticism at all of uh, the people who try to run it in this hospital. In fact, I think Claire Dollery and her team have done a great job of trying to rationalise it. Um, but we have to work with what we've got. Um, it looks a pretty useful audience this morning. Um, just like to s get a show of hands. Who's been involved in investigating serious incidents as an investigator? Quite a few. And uh, who's been on the other side of the table? Sorry, I should have put my hands up for both. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so um, some of you I haven't put your hands up for either, um, because you're ingenues and this hasn't happened to you yet, but it will. Um, and when it does, there is a serious incident framework, and it's pretty logical. You have to identify the problem, gather and map information, analyze the information, generate a solution. What's not to like? Well, that uh, is what happens next, in that uh, the NHS is fabulous at producing uh, forms, and forms of bureaucracy, and we tend to make this very complicated. But we don't necessarily make it um, as rational as it could be. And what I'd like to do is ask some of you, um, if you have any insights to give, uh, what your experience of the system has been. Um, these are some of the things that we have to do. So it becomes quite complicated, and we are kind of honor bound to investigate pretty much anything that goes into Datix. So that uh, produces a massive potential workload. Um, we have some very nice principles. Uh, does anyone know the seven key principles? Or not? Anyone want to guess what they are? Oh, never mind. I'll let you know. There you are. So. Um, Investigations ought to be open and transparent, preventative, collaborative, proportionate, systems-based, timely, responsive, objective. There you are. Here are some of the things that um, we've felt as a group, um, because we've been in involved in investigations for a wee while now, and these are some of the things that um, maybe could be better in the NHS system as constructed from London down. So investigators an awful lot of investigations to do. And as some of the consultants here may know, you don't actually receive any training when you get fingered to do an investigation. It's, it's you. Um, some of the people, and this is one of the things that Claire has improved, uh, who support you have got some, some training, but they're pretty um, stretched because um, there's an awful lot to do with relatively few people. Um, We've mentioned the person-focused aspect, which is something Don Berwick, the sort of guru of patient safety, said when he was asked to investigate uh, Mid-Staffordshire, that we have a problem with a, a blame culture and a culture of fear. And that's very hard to eradicate, even with the best of efforts. Um, and we often, because we're trying to do this in a hurry, with a relatively small group of people, some of whom don't have any training, 
come up with superficial explanations. And we uh, make recommendations like uh, improve adherence to policy, right? Um, more training, that's a favorite one. Um, <clears throat> put up more notices. Um, these are traditional things that we get from the, the standard NHS investigations. Um, we think that could be improved on. And what we're going to talk about now, um, and I'm going to hand over to um, Lauren, who is the human factors professional, is how human factors science can help us. Because it is actually what all the pe other people who have to deal with really serious problems and high risk uh, use in trying to analyze their own work and their own problems. So, all right. So first of all, I'm going to explain a little bit about what the science of human factors is for those of you that are not 100% familiar with it. And so we have our, our hospital, and the way that human factors thinks of a hospital is in terms of a complex system, a socio-technical system. And socio-technical because of the human interactions with the technical, and we have um, a great deal of those within our hospital systems here. Other systems, um, such as nuclear, may be much more technical focused um, and much less on the socio component. And um, maybe other interactions, such as schools, might be much more on the socio end. But hospitals, we generally decide, uh, describe as a complex socio technical system. And what I mean by that is that we've got the um, individuals, the people, and the teams. Uh, that are working within our hospitals and the skills and um, experiences that they bring along with them. We've got the technology that we're using and the various forms in which that may take and also the physical tools. In surgery you have a bewildering array of equipment and tools that you interact with in your um, theatre environment and those either interact well together or perhaps they don't um, and often those interactions are not considered in the design of, of things so I'm sure most manufacturers when thinking about putting a new piece of equipment into the operating theatre don't necessarily consider the other 50 pieces of equipment that are currently in your operating theatre that they have to coexist with. Um, the tasks that you have to do are extremely varied um, perhaps designed, perhaps not well designed, perhaps a historical thing like a ward round that everyone would rec recognise, or perhaps a new procedure that you've not been involved in um, before or, not, or received a little amount of training in. The physical environment, so I hinted a little bit about this with the operating theatre, but of course you encounter a wide range of designs of physical environment. I could really design this lecture theatre to be much more pleasant for you to sit in and for me to lecture to. And often the physical environments that you're interacting with with your patients across the variety of healthcare spaces that we have in this trust cannot be necessarily optimised for you to give the best patient care that you would want to. And the organisation, the structures of the organisation, the different line management structures that you have in your organisation who's reporting to where, how are they reporting, how is the training provided, what's the communication like through the organisation. All of these elements are part of what we consider to be the system of work in a hospital. And that's all nicely wrapped up in the culture bundle. And um, each, almost each ward can have its own culture when you walk on and there's a feeling of this is how we do things here and um, each hospital will have its own unique culture and the NHS has its own unique culture as you're reflecting on earlier in difference to other um, countries and um, areas. And so what does this actually feel like for us in our day-to-day -day lives? Well, these are some pictures that I took when I was working at the um, Nuffield Orthopaedic Centre a few years ago now. And um, of course, uh, wrong site surgery is a never event and possibly career ending or it used to be career ending for those that are involved um, to the level and yet these lists were not um, hard examples to come by in the operating theatre so things like scrubbing out and change of which side the operation is on um, the fact that someone's typed query side onto the list um, we've got a complex sarcoma removal and free flap 
operation, but the side labelling of any of that is, is not detailed. And so really the system design here, the elements before we've even reached the human, are setting us up to fail. You know, I would not be surprised if something went wrong in this situation, but it's really hard in the case of an incident to go back and pick up that piece of paper that had that scribbled right arm excision, left free groin, groin flap, um, when it comes to perhaps a block being put in the wrong place. My favourite is the electronic patient record. Um, when I say favourite, I mean least favourite. <laughs> Uh, so these are some examples of some icons that are used or were used in our electronic patient records. So we've got three different states of um, situation. So a complete patient record, an incomplete patient record, and the patient has allergies, and three different icons. Would anyone like to guess which might be which? <coughs> um, be brave. Wrong. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you win a donor. <laughs> it is the incomplete patient. The incomplete rate. So, as a database designer, as the person that would be designing a, a database for patient records, the most concerning aspect for you would be to have an incomplete patient record because, of course, you don't have all the information there to give to the end user the picture that you want to give. But of course, without the consideration of the clinical environment and what that might mean for the clinicians, that's really dangerous. So it's these tiny, tiny systems elements of how the technology is designed, how the organization is set up that can make a real difference. Um, so those are the answers for you, should you ever come across it. So I'm gonna give you a short example of how this can um, all wrap itself up, but I'm gonna step outside healthcare for a minute. And I'm going to take you to my hometown of Marlow. Um, so this is uh, the road. If any of you have been to the Complete Angler, which is on the right-hand side, um, really lovely Sindhu restaurant at the moment. I can highly recommend it. Um, that's not what this is. This is a baby, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, that that helps. <laughs> so as you drive through Marlow, you get this picture up to the bridge, and you drive over this what was a beautiful bridge, but what's got some. Um, <coughs> on it and you look right and you get this beautiful picture of the weir that you can see from the complete angler and all the rest of it um, and what happened in Marlow was this lorry went over the bridge and so there's a weight limit on the bridge for 3.5 tons and the lorry was 36 tons and it went over the bridge and so the main route into Marlow from the south was closed for six months while they explored all of the um, joints on the bridge and made sure that it was safe for anyone to go over. It's now open again and you can guess <laughs> what's going to happen soon. There's constantly pictures on my social media feed about people going over this bridge overweight. Uh, it's become part of the sort of local evil person spotting exercise. And so you can see by starting to take the systems view, immediately it swings things from that people-centred view that's really damaging into considering all of the aspects of the system that might have contributed and you, know, you can do this in a real life situation well, obviously this is real life but you know to actually dig through the facts and find out but often you'll find about 80 percent of the stuff just by considering a hypothetical incident within your environment so considering the next time um, you might put in a wrong site block or whatever or, um, or that your operating list overruns, and you'll get the vast majority of the things that are wrong in the system just by doing that thought exper experiment among you. This is a really simple breakdown of, an, of a system. My personal favorite is the JCAHO um, patient safety event taxonomy. So if you wanted to be really thorough in the investigation of a, a clinical incident, this breaks things down really nicely into the different elements that you might want to consider might have played a part in an incident that you would have been involved in or that you're investigating. And this has lots of the same um, elements that we're hinting at in the simple fishbone. Um, so human factors analysis doesn't just look back at incidents. We can do some prospective analysis as well, and probably one of the most famous ones of those is a failure modes and effects analysis. And that's just a tabular approach to um, systematically considering the risks that would exist within each task step. Um, 
We can also look at cognitive task analysis. What are the ways in which people are thinking about things? How could um, something be missed in that way? Um, do they have the level of understanding or uh, perhaps training to complete the tasks that they're set up to do? And we could look at some usability testing. So all of you did some usability testing on those icons earlier and indicated that they probably weren't safe. And so some usability testing on some elements of your system can probably give you some indications of where areas of risk might be. We can look at allocation of functions. So in terms of setting your theatre up for a day, are you front loading all of the effort on one member of the team and then all of a sudden switching everything over to the other? Or is there ways in which you could sw switch around who's doing what and, and spread the function allocation about a little bit? Non-technical skills assessment. We're, you're so lucky here to have the Oxstar group within the hospital that are so um, well developed in their uh, development of um, human factors team at training courses and um, so you could look at what your non-technical skills are within your theatre team and then perhaps access some of that resource um, that we have here and of course there's many many more so the um, uh, human factors is now supported by the Chartered Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors so if you did want more resources in that area and clearly I'm not going to be around for much longer <laughs> there are others of me within our group but also that there's a, a Chartered Institute that you can go to. So in summary, human factors incident analysis allows a systematic analysis of the human interactions in the workplace. So we're not saying that the human isn't important, we're saying what elements of the system played their part. We've got a set of tools to drive that analysis and um, this, this approach is the standard approach to incident analysis in high reliability organisations. So we believe it's the, the right way for hospital trust to be going. So. Um, we thought we would um, give you some more examples and some more work to do. Um, and we're going to talk uh, now and get you to comment on an investigation we were asked to do by a famous London teaching hospital, which we're not going to mean. Um, but uh, basically, uh, we're going to ask you to think about it and see if you can use the fishbowl and various other uh, human factors tools uh, to think your own way through it. So um, this is an example of the sort of human factors based invest systems oriented investigation that we think uh, is more valuable than the traditional NHS process. Here it is. Um, this was a gentleman in his early 70s who had a spinal metastasis from renal cancer and it was causing him intractable pain and he was consuming large amounts of MST. And people expected he was going to live for a while because he didn't have any other metastases evident. Um, and he was showing early signs of cord compression. So um, it wasn't something he could wait. He needed an operation to relieve the pressure. He was pretty fit. Um, and he had his decompression operation by a neurosurgery team. And they accidentally opened the Duramator that was not a technical error, that was basically uh, tumour involvement, um, but that caused CSF to leak out. Now, as you know, CSF doesn't clot, um, it needs to be drained, otherwise you're going to get a soggy infection-prone wound, so they put a drain in, and they used a Redivac drain. Everyone here knows what a Redivac drain is, do you? So, for those who don't, it's um, a very narrow, about one to two millimetre tube with side holes, and it's attached to a suction bottle. Um, the surgeon left in strict instructions that suction should not be applied to the bottle and put a label on the bottle saying, no suction. Um, the patient was then admitted to ITU over the weekend, and on Monday at about 1.30 in the morning, a um, uh, night nurse put the drain on suction. Result, all the CSF in the spinal cord went into the bottle, the brainstem went into the frame and magnum, patient combed and died. That was why no suction. So, how did that happen? So I'd just like you to um, use, in thinking about this, um, a couple of ideas. Lauren's taken you through a five-dimensional uh, model of how things happen in systems. And this is another simpler three-dimensional model that we use around here. 
And in our investigations, we actually use both because they overlap, but they complement each other. The three-dimensional one, as you can see, is very simple. You just think about what went wrong with the system. What influence could the culture have had? And was there a technology problem? One of the things that you've probably heard of that we use for investigations, and it's in the NHS um, manuals, is, is five whys. I think five whys gets misinterpreted a lot. Does anyone know why it's five whys? Everybody know what I'm talking about? You just keep digging. So we, you ask, why did, nobody, why did the message get lost? And then when um, people say, because of handover, you say, well, why was handover inadequate? And you say, well, because X didn't tell Y that. So why didn't they tell them that? And you keep digging until it makes sense. The reason it's five, incidentally, is because it was invented <coughs> in Japan. And the Japanese like five because it's their lucky number. And if you, if you watch around for things from Japan, you'll see lots and lots of things come in fives. So, um, as we've discussed, it's the only drain that fits in that hole in the spinal canal outside the dura that's easily available in the NHS. Um, they, other neurosurgeons I asked about this said, oh yeah, but what we do is we disable the suction on the bottle. We do something to the bottle like stick a green needle in the side or cut the end off the little teeth that does the suction so that it can't be, can't be suctioned anymore. And we went back to them and said, why did you do that? And they said, well, we used to do that, but infection control said it was an infection risk, so they stopped us doing that. So um, <clears throat> why did the message get lost? Well, one thing was that they had a pretty, I have to say, my experience, this is pretty typical, we don't usually go around to recovery with the patient too often. In a lot of surgical specialties, the person who goes around to recovery with the patient is the anaesthetist, and the surgeon may or may not, but the surgeon is quite often busy writing up notes, taking off their student's logbook, their, their trainee's logbook, making sure the next patient's there, having a tea, whatever. Um, so the surgeon wasn't physically present to say, this is really important. And that often happens. Likewise, this was a pretty traditional setup. This is about five years ago now. EPRs weren't all over the place then. But what you got, and I suspect you still get with the patient, is a kind of loose leaf dustbin of various bits of paper they've accumulated in the hours since they came into the hospital for their operation. And one of those is the operation which in this case was handwritten, but, ex but perfectly legible and underlined, do not place on such. <coughs> but it was in there with the rest of the mess, so difficult to access. The warning, as we said, came loose, and there was unstructured, inadequate handover. Now that's a bit harsh, isn't it? I think most places in the NHS still have unstructured, inadequate handover. That doesn't mean it should be like that. And the other interesting thing we unearthed was that there were multiple shift handovers in recovery. The patient stayed in recovery for, I think, six hours. And during that time, there were five different nurses looking after the patient. So multiple handovers and opportunities for Chinese whispers. Now, I think maybe you begin to see what I mean by five whys. Because you must be thinking some more whys. What are you thinking? Why were there so many shift handles? So Great question. Um, answer is because it's a central London, London teaching hospital. We asked, we asked them about that, and they said, this is a central London teaching hospital. Retaining good nurses is very difficult because what we pay them is buttons compared to the cost of living in London. So we do everything we can to make their lives easy, and that means flexible shifts. One of the things that we offer them is will make your working life easy by letting you go home when you want. So, by bad luck, they had nurse after nurse after nurse had to go off and have to go to another one. So we've explained about the staff issue. Um, nobody asked why was the patient in recovery for six hours? Well, the answer was this is a patient who had a lot of pain. The patient woke up in pain. The patient was on a PCA for pain. And recovery knew very well that this ITU couldn't deal with PCAs. That's an extraordinary thing, but it was true. They were so worried about their ability to deal with PCAs that they had a protocol that when a PCA needed refilling, they had to go to recovery to do it. So 
the, pa the patient, the uh, nurses said, we're not going to send this patient around until we've got the patient pain under control, which is why it took so long, which led to all the handovers, which led to the loss of communication. Okay. Why did nobody ask the surgeons? The surgeons did come. They did comment. But as Lawrence says, uh, this CareView EPR system that was used on the ICU uh, didn't allow logons by anyone who wasn't employed in ITU. So you couldn't record anything. And as you know, it's a disciplinary offense to steal somebody else's logon. So um, they didn't have any dedicated junior staff in their specialty in the hospital. Actually, the spinal list was a bit of an anomaly. This was an ITU that normally dealt with more general surgery stuff. So that was why there wasn't the expertise there saying, oh, this is a big danger. Um, and the operation notes and other paperwork couldn't be transcribed onto PicareView. So the work nurses were working essentially with an electronic patient record that didn't contain the vital information. And the unit had what was called a closed unit. Now, any of the surgeons here who've worked with different ITUs across <coughs> different hospitals know that they have different attitudes to their interaction with the, the users, the consultant staff of the hospital. And some of the closed ITUs are very closed. You know, they can see your lips moving, but they can't hear what you're saying. And this was one of those. So there was not a culture of, oh, why shouldn't we ask the surgeon? Because we don't ask the surgeons. We've, we, organ we treat the patients in here. So when there was bewilderment about what to do with the drain, they asked the doctors in the ITU, who also didn't know. <laughs> so it's a complicated story, but these are some of the conclusions we came to. And here I'd stress, Jim, we're not blaming the, pay, pay, the people. We're trying to make recommendations that are going to change the system. Procurement. Can we get a better drain? Actually, no. If we can't get a better drain, maybe we just go back to infection control and say, is this really a big problem? Can we find a way of disabling this, the bottle? Standardized handover. Our team has worked on this and published on this in other areas. And I think it's one of the big safety misses that we're currently um, implementing in the NHS. Um, can we do anything about the HR policy? That's a tough one. They need to keep their staff. But maybe they should think about uh, whether there are certain areas of the hospital where some of the policies that they're currently carrying out are a bit risky. And the ITU. Clearly, there are some things for the ITU to think about here. Um, they need to get sorted out so that they can use PCA. Um, and they need to have a more user-friendly relationship with the rest of the hospital. Their relationship with the rest of the hospital actually had a big influence on this happening. They could also write on the bottle an indelible <laughs> IP, no suction. Well, they could. Um, and warnings are helpful, but they're not as helpful as making it impossible to do the wrong thing. The best warning I've seen is, I don't know if anyone's ever driven on the freeway in the US. As you're, as you're going on the slip road, if you look in your rear view mirror, you can see a huge red sign that says, wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> but by then, it may be too late. So just to say that this is actually not everybody else's problem far away. As I started, it's more uncomfortable when it happens here. Uh, Helen Hyam and I have been using this human factors approach in looking at never events in this hospital over the last couple of years. And here are four types of never events we've investigated. And I've deliberately jumbled up the conclusions we reached so that hopefully you can't, remember, can't recall which one was which. But we've had two of the most experienced anaesthetists in the trust managing to mix each other up over a wrong site block because they distracted each other at a critical moment. Um, we've had standardization and checklists as a big problem in one of the incidents. Um, we've had an unearthed serious disagreement between teams on how emergency lists should function, cultural resistance to marking of sites, serious issues with trainee rotors, so, and high-risk complex surgery happening without explicit protocols to avoid errors that when you look at the system, you think something's going to go wrong here. So all of these things have happened in our own hospital over the last couple of years. So we're not perfect either. But I think the way we've conducted these investigations has unearthed these problems more successfully than probably another um, way of doing it would. Now, we've only got a couple of minutes. I want to run through what we're doing next. Because we think we should take this further. One of the key issues that we haven't dealt with 
in this so far is conflict of interest. And the consultants amongst you will know that that can be a big issue when you've got a nasty incident and there's a lot of tension around, who's going to investigate it? If you get somebody from within the hospital who knows about the specialty, they, may, they will always have a relationship with the people who are directly involved. And that relationship can bias you in a good way or a bad way, but it's hard to be unbiased. Um, and the army and the police already have this, and there are some notorious examples of this. Um, so spreading good factor, practice in human factors is desirable, but so is having independence, and so is having consistency. And we've got the new Health Services Investigation Board coming into, into um, being now, this year. There are only 30 of them. They're never going to be able to deal with all the serious incidents in the NHS. So they need to develop a policy and an infrastructure to interact with the rest of us. And so what we've been trying to do is work with the whole Thames Valley region. And this is just a bit of an organogram to explain all the acronyms. So QRSTU is our research group. OXSTAR is the Human Factors and Simulation training group that Helen runs. And together, we've created the Patient Safety Academy, which is the group that's doing this. And it's one of the four things that we agreed to do when we got funding for the Patient Safety Academy. And what we're doing is we're setting up external review between hospitals in Thames Valley. So there are five acute trusts in Thames Valley, plus Oxford Health, which will be joining the system shortly. Um, and we're trying to develop a system of mutual exchange of skilled investigators who've had human factors training. Each trust putting forward two senior people who've already done internal investigations. The medical directors have all agreed to accept external review. And we're doing a pilot program this year of two incidents per hospital. So far, it's going OK. Um, we've got agreement in principle from all the medical directors. We're drawing up a memorandum of understanding because hospitals have all sorts of regulations about who can come in, who can look at their notes, etc. We've done training for investigators from all the sites, and we've done the first investigation here in November. We've got the second and the third one lined up, and we've had very positive discussions with Health Services Investigation Board, who like our model and are wanting to get into discussions with us, and we see potential for this as being a template for how the rest of the NHS could do this. So far, though, we've learned from experience, and some of the things we've learned have been quite interesting. As you might expect, there's been quite a lot of initial defensiveness about allowing people from other trusts to come in. And it's clear that giving people two days of intensive human factors training isn't necessarily enough. They need to be mentored for a while. So Helen and I, Lauren, are going to be involved in, well, not Lauren so much in the immediate future, um, in going with these people to help them. Um, it's going to cost some money, but the costs will be pretty low because we're mainly about us administering the system. And there are deadlines for reporting serious incidents. The CCGs need them reported in a certain time. We've already managed to uh, successfully negotiate with CCGs in one case that we could extend that because we're getting the external review. And the internal-external partnership is interesting. As I say, with the London example, they did a full investigation and then handed over to us. What we're trying to work out at the moment is what's the best relationship between the people who did the internal and the external investigation. Because if we leave it until right at the end, there's a feeling by the internal people that somebody's coming along to mark their homework. And we'd rather have a partnership. So that's about it. Um, we think serious mishaps are usually multifactorial, and simple one-action solutions are rarely effective. Human factor science provides the tools. And these things are usually multifactorial events. Um, and I've well, wait a minute. <laughs> Late at night. OK. Independence of investigators should be a basic principle. And we think uh, this is the, best, the right way to go. Um, we run courses on this if anyone's interested in going on them. The next one's in March. Um, if you would like to be involved in the external review program, I'm sure we could talk to you about that. And the last thing is just to say some thank yous. Um, Lauren, I didn't put you on the list, but I guess this is thank you. <laughs> <laughs> for a while. But thank you all very much. Um, I guess we've got time for a couple of questions.